Pokemon Scarlet and Violet gave us three new rival friend characters, Arvin, Pneumonia, and the protagonist from Fire Emblem Engage. Out of those three, Arvin was the center of the game's plot. Oh no, he's not related to Hop, is he? In the main story, he asks us, the protagonist, to help him fight the Titan Pokemon and collect the five Herba Mystica scattered throughout the Paldea region. Of course, I like to ask stupid questions, so I instantly wondered, couldn't Arvin just beat up the Titan Pokemon by himself? To get my answer to this question and more, I decided to play through the entire game as the sandwich making king himself. So I booted up a new save in Pokemon Scarlet and tried to style my trainer to look as much like Arvin as possible. But you'd think with all these customization options I could do something better, but no. Apparently this is what playable Arvin would look like. I did want to experience maximum Arvin is during this run and since I had to cut corners with the haircut, I didn't want to cut any corners with his team. The nice thing about Arvin is that he adds one Pokemon per Titan and starts starts out with the squabbit he just caught near the lighthouse. Okay, technically he also has a terminally ill Pokemon that cannot battle, and the legendary Pokemon that also can't battle. But hey, at least this one works as a bike. Honestly, I'd ask someone for help at this point too. But not this time, because I am a strong independent Arvin. I can handle this myself, probably. Our first target would be the Stony Cliff Titan, which is a rock type. But considering that squabbit can barely beat up a Chudo, I will need to come up with some sort of strategy. Mudslap. Mudslap is my strategy. It's a very very weak ground type move that reduces the foe's accuracy every time it hits. With a move like this, we can basically dodge every single attack and spam tackle until we win. Here, I'll try it out in a battle against Nimona. Okay, maybe Mudslap isn't such a good idea. This is where you're probably thinking, wait a minute, doesn't Arvin have a shelter when he battles Cloth? The answer of course is yes, but just like with the haircut, the game keeps coming up with ways to prevent me from becoming my Arvin best. Shelter are a water type Pokemon that live in the sea, so even though I could see some from the seashore, I can't actually battle any of them. That's because I can't swim, Coridon can't swim, and my Let's Go Pokemon can't. They just can't anything, apparently. Is it just me or is this feature completely useless in the water in general? The only other possible way to get a shelter was through a terror raid, so I went through all of the possible terror raid dens and found a grand total of zero shelters. Sigh. Since the game gods refused to give me a shelter, I had to find another way to deal with cloth, and I did. While looking around the tunnels near the east gate, I found myself the TM for Bullet Seed, a grass type move that our squavid can learn. And good thing it did, otherwise we would have been mud slapping this cloth so much that it would look like a crusto by the time we're done with it. After its first defeat, the stony cliff titan munches on some Herba Mystica to restore its health and power itself up. This is where real Arvin joins us and helps us out with that shelter of his. Anyways, we win the second time thanks to the Mudslap strategy and get ourselves the sweet Herba Mystica, set to aid digestion and I guess we're not supposed to feed our bike. But hey, he can run even faster now, and since we've cleared out one Titan, I can add one more Pokemon to the team, Nackley, the grain of salt Pokemon, which happens to spawn in the same area as Cloth. It makes sense for Arvin to catch one right here and right now. From there, I made my way to Cartondo, where I rode some olives and battled Catty, the first gym leader. Why am I doing the gyms? Because I'll need to do the story quest for Nimona and Penny in order to experience all of Arvin's story as Arvin, so I figured I'd start now, and not when my entire team is level 60. Nackley took a turn to polish itself for greater speed, then smacked down Nimbo and Tarantula with some rocks. The Terra Teddy Ursa was pretty bulky, but missed its first attack, leaving it with just a few HP before knocking us out, but we still had Squavit. I did try to take on the second gym with the current team, but considering that those two couldn't even make it past the small of, I did a U-turn backwards toward Cartondo to look for the open sky titan. Nackley wasn't as useful in this battle as I had expected, falling in the red near the start of the battle and forcing me to use my one-time heal so that we didn't end up with three useless Pokemon. Thankfully we landed a critical hit and that got the Bombardier to use their one-time healing item, the Herba Mystica. Rio Arvin shows up with his Nackley and together we throw even more rocks at the bird while it tries to torment us. That tactic didn't stop us from getting up the mountain and it won't stop us from winning the battle. After defeating the giant bird we got ourselves the better Herba Mystica which is great for circulation and swimming. Is this true? Is better food the secret to learning how to swim in real life? Asking for a friend. The friend is me. Anywho, now that Karaidon can go in the water, I can finally go and catch a shelter, which is gonna be really useful against the grass type gym, right? Things weren't looking too hot for Arvin, who had to terrestrialize his Squavit just to finish off Brassius' first Pokemon. This time we managed to one-shot the Smolif, meaning we finally get to face off against Trula Wudo. Her first body slam managed to paralyze this fake flower, and this time we were bulky enough to take a couple of hits and break Brassius' master 
recipes. Don't worry, he has at least 20 more scattered around the city. Since we're on our way towards the third titan, we had another Pokemon for me to catch in the fields near Artisan, Toad School. This cursed abomination could also be found near Cartondo, but I wanted to see if Arvin could get the second gym badge without the extra help. Now all we need to do is find it. It does show up on the little mini-map thing, but I can't see it anywhere in the wild. And since I didn't want to just run around in circles forever, I pulled an Arvin and made myself a sandwich. The Jambon Burr. Uh, Jambon Burr. I'm not French, but I'm pretty sure ce n'est pas how you pronounce it. Jambon Burr. Oh, it literally just means ham and butter. Anyways, this sandwich has an encounter power boost for ground types. And since Toad School is a ground type Pokemon, it should show up a lot easier now. Look at this dude just standing there menacingly. With Toad School in hand, it was time to raid the Shedder base. Did you know that Shedder is the name of the brightest star in the Cassiopeia constellation? Kind of fitting considering how Mela burns the brightest out of the team star leaders. And since she easily kicked Arvin's butt, I had to go back and fight a bunch of Venonads to level up my team and evolve Nackly into my favorite Minecraft mob, Nacostack. With the added bulk, we could finally finish off Mela's Torko and face off against her car. Quest. Considering she had the speed boost and just hit us with a screech, the only viable strategy in this battle was to mud slap and hope we don't get hit. And since we needed to do some actual damage, I decided to terrestrialize Greedent and attack with a body slam. Mela did eventually manage to hit us with a blazing torque, but thankfully Greedent bulked through the attack and finished off the fight. Now that the team star barricade is gone, I can finally get to Lavincia and buy some new clothes. Sadly, there aren't any huge backpacks or hiking boots, so this will have to do. Great! For this battle, I had Shelter take the lead and use its ice shard attack on the Watchroll, except she paralyzes us and uses Quick Attack to finish off our first Pokemon. Minecraft Beef is out next, using Smackdown to lower Iono's view count. Then it Salt Cures Belly Bolt, which will chip away one eighth of its health at the end of every turn, even if it takes us down. Toad School comes out to finish off the fight with a Mud Shot, and I completely forgot that she had a Luxio. I hope you won't forget to like Steel this video. That was cringio. The battle comes down to Iono's Terra Magius versus our Terra Greedent. She tries to be funny and set up a Charge Beam, but Greedent lands a critical hit hit body slam, ending the battle in a single move. The worm. The orth worm. This titan is able to eat up our ground type moves, meaning that our mudslap strategy has finally met its match. Sadly, our silly little toad school couldn't do much against the lurking steel titan. Shelder tried to chip away at its health with whirlpool but got whacked with a critical iron tail and fainted. Thankfully, Nako stack is super stacked in this fight, using salt cure to do major damage between turns. With the wiggler on the run, I paid a quick visit to this traveling pokemon center, then rushed over to Rio Arvin and join him for the Rio battle. His Toad School kept missing its supersonics while mine kept hitting with its screeches. Eventually, the Orthworm did punch itself in confusion, but it barely did any damage. Since both of our Toad School were doing uncool amount of damage, I sent out Nako Stack next and used Salt Cure to chip away at the worm's health while throwing a bunch of salty rocks at it. With this salty Herba Mystica, our hands and feet can be healthy, meaning Karaidon can jump even higher now. That's it. Is it just me, or is this the most disappointing of the right Pokemon? Pokemon upgrades. And since the next Titan was all the way on the other side of the map, we used this upgrade to jump all the way over to Team Star's second base, which happens to be the name of another super bright star in the Cassiopeia constellation. There we battled Toby Fox, whose pawner nearly finished off Nacostack in two hits. Since his strategy was to spam Snarl, I decided to spam Leer and Screech to lower his physical defenses. This made his modern A car fold like paper at the slightest bump or body press. See? What I didn't want to see was the fourth gym leader running away from his gym. Was Nimona looking for someone to battle in there or something? Since I didn't want to risk having to fight her a million times, I agreed to deliver Kafu's wallet to Porto Marinata. But first, I went behind the gym to pick up a water stone and evolve Shelter into something more useful. On our way out of Cascarafa, I ran into a Capsicid, the next Pokemon that Arvin catches. The only problem is that I needed mine to have the chlorophyll ability, but I kept catching ones with Insomnia instead. Trust me Capsicid, you don't want Insomnia. From there, we ran into the Quaking Earth Titan, Great Tusk, where we were definitely under leveled, but thankfully Salt Cure does not care about our levels, one eighth of its health every single turn. Now I just needed to stall for long enough, just need to... Okay, there you go. Good thing Toad Screw is fully evolved as well now. And time to battle a little all over again. Also, whoops, it looks like real Arvin Scovillain was from the mountains nearby, not a Capsa kid from the desert. This means that once we finished up with the Orthworm, he headed northwest from Zapapico and caught one along the way. Since my Pokemon were super underleveled for this fight, all I could do was spam Mud Slap and watch real Arvin carry me through the battle with Razor Leaf after Razor Leaf, taking down Great Tusk and getting ourselves the Sour Herb.
Herba Mystica perks you right up, or in Karaidon's case, gives you wings. Is this the secret ingredient to Red Bull? I quickly evolved Capsicid and made my way down to Porto Marinata, where I had to beat up Kofu's babysitter and win an auction for some seaweed. If he really wanted the seaweed that bad, I could have just showed him a picture of Sprigatito. Never mind, this guy's not a big fan of grass types. This was my last easy fight, because Larry and his star after absolutely destroyed Arvin's team. So instead of going in for a rematch, I decided to fly back to Zapapico and try tackling the Navi squad. Also, did you know that Navi is the informal name for the middle star of the Cassiopeia constellation? Since my strongest ground type move was Mudslap, I once again failed to seize victory. This made me realize that if Arvin tried to take on the gym challenge or team star before he collected all five Arba Mystica, he would probably end up failing about halfway through. Both Larry and Atticus were too strong. Uh, of course, I'm not just gonna give up, so I went back to Medali and challenged Larry for a rematch. Greedon body slammed Kamala, but then fell asleep. Knowing that Larry will try to hit us with a status effect, they send out Nacostack next and Salt Cure Dunsparce. He did take us down, but the Salt Cure finished him off. That left Cloyster up against the Intimidating Staraptor, and since it terrestrializes into a normal type, our Icicle Spears won't be as effective here. We were bulky enough to tank a second hit, and that meant I could drop a potion, take another hit, and then have enough HP to spare for one last attack. This victory gave me enough courage to go back and rematch Atticus as well. Instead of trying to be funny, I went for an all-out offensive with Greedon's body slams, taking out the skun tank and putting a nice big squirrel-sized dent in Muck's HP. Told Screw finished it off with a mud shot and did the same to the small rever room. Big rever room was gonna be a big problem, so I set up a salt cure with knackle stack since that does tend to mess up cars in real life. Northerners know what I'm talking about. And send out Cloyster who could bulk through flame charge attacks as if they were tackles from a Route 1. Wait, that's not a thing anymore. From an area 1 Lechong. Just like Larry, we were able to win on our second try thanks to Cloyster's massive physical defense and its skill link ability, which let us spam Icicle Spears until we won. With my morale boosted, I made my way up to Monta Nevera, where Moist Critical opened up the stage and I battled with Rhyme. In terms of gym designs, I really enjoyed how they approached this one, but they really didn't have to bother with the random attack boost from the audience. Since Greed and New Bite, it was a pretty easy win for Arvin. Knowing we'd have some tough battles up ahead, I decided to make a ham and pickle sandwich near the Rookpa squad's base. Did you know that Rookpa is the name of a star in the Cassiopeia constellation, and it also means knee. The chance you have knees. Anyways, after leveling up our team a bit, we quickly won against Ortega and flew down to Cassiora Lake. Th did the game just teleport us all the way to the other side of this lake? Good thing that the watchtower saved as a flight point. The final titan was hiding on Sashimi Island, where a bunch of talking Tatsugiri gather, only to be eaten alive by the false dragon titan. I can't believe they actually showed a Pokemon being eaten alive in a Pokemon game. Greedon really struggled here since this thing has the defense of a Zamazenta, and that Pokemon is literally a giant shield. Thankfully, the good old Mudslap strategy let us dodge enough attacks to win the first fight. As someone who cannot swim, the sight of this thing popping in and out of the water as I chased it over to the next island was kind of terrifying. Never did I think I'd see the day when a Pokemon game made me feel gut-wrenching fear, but here we are. Real Arvin joined for the second battle and thanks to Mudslap, the Don Dozo was Donzo for real, yo. But then we had to fight the true Dragon Titan, who took down my Greedon before it could set up a bunch of Mudslaps. Thankfully, Cloyster could easily carry the rest of the fight with its Icicle Spears, defeating the last Titan and getting us the spicy Herba Mystica, which boosts your metabolism, or in our case, gives us the power to climb. For the real Arvin, the fifth Herba Mystica meant something else entirely. I've avoided talking about it until now, but his whole reason for going on this quest was to help restore his Pokemon's health back to normal. This Mabostiff is not only Arvin's true starter Pokemon, it is his best buddy, and he got really hurt when they went to explore Area Zero looking for Arvin's mom. The damage it took was so severe that not even the Pokemon Center could help this poor old Mabostiff, so Arvin had to turn to Urban Legends and Natural Remedies, namely the Urban Mystica, which were described in the Scarlet Book from his mother's lab. The lab at the base of the lighthouse, the lab where we first met Arvin. And now that his Mabostiff is finally back to tip-top shape, real Arvin would like to meet us there once more. But he's gonna have to wait since we still have two more gyms to fight and one team star leader to go. Using our newly acquired climbing ability, I made my way up to the northern parts of Cassiora Lake and caught one of the Mabostiff which hang around in the area. I'm not gonna be as emotionally attached to this one as real Arvin, but it's our new ace Pokemon. Since I can climb, I can also go collect all of the TMs I needed to fully match Arvin's movesets. Oh no, am I stuck like this? 
I haven't saved in hours, please video game. Eventually I made my way to Alfornada and challenged gym leader Tulip to a battle. I think I did something out of order because my team was definitely overleveled for this one. And Grusha too, because Greedon and Scovillain single handedly carried both of the fights. I guess after taking down all 5 titans, Arvin is just unstoppable now. Might as well go take on the Calf Squad, which also happens to be the name of the 5th and final star of the Cassiopeia constellation and it means Palm. Maybe it should mean Fist instead because Eric punched her whole team out of existence in no time. Arvin stood no chance against her specifically. In the face of defeat, I made another ham and pickle sandwich and battled some more Chansey to prepare for the next battle. Not against Aerie, but the Elite Four. Those were easier to fight than Aerie. My first test there was to remember which gym leader gave me the most trouble, and for Arvin, that would be Larry. But I kind of forgot how hard the fight was and said Brassius instead. Good thing the game didn't actually know the answer. Rika's actual team was just as easy to get through thanks to our bullet seed and power whip attacks. Poppy's steel types couldn't stand up to Scovillain's fire blast and Toad Scroll's earth power. Larry showed up for revenge because how dare I forget about the most normal guy in the game and his flying type Pokemon stood no chance against Cloyster's icicle spears. Shoulda just stuck with normal types dude. Never mind he actually has a good counter here. Oracorio is a great Pokemon and I'm so glad they brought it back in the game. It's not in this game anymore though. Neither is Larry. You only get to see him like one more time after this battle. They need to fix this in the DLC. That left us with the final Elite Four member, Hassel, who wasn't actually that easy to beat. His first three dragons all went down to Cloyster's Icicle Spears, but Haxorus stopped us in their tracks. I'm starting to get Leon flashbacks all of a sudden. Toadscrew was able to finish it off with an Earth Power, but then got steamrolled by Baxcalibur. Almost. The friendship mechanic got triggered as it survived by 1 HP, which reminds me to use Herbal Medicine for the future runs of this game. For now, I just dropped an Orin Berry and let Toadscrew faint. This silly move left me with just Mabo Stiff and I continued to be silly as I terrestrialized it into a dark type just so I can use play rough. Literally zero benefit for that one attack but hey, I wanted to win in style. Having conquered the Elite Four, Arvin now had one more trainer to battle before claiming the role of champion. Gita, the top champion in Paldea. Not gonna lie gamer, she was a bit of a pushover compared to Leon. Her Avalug is a great physical wall but stands no chance against her special attacker like Scovillain. Her King Gambit comes out way too early. Valusa is very squishy, and her go go to try to set up a bulk up instead of attack, then fainted to burn damage on its first turn. Glimora looks cool, and it was finally able to take down Scovillain, but it could barely do any damage to Toadscrew, who finished it off with two power whips. If we were simply to ask, could Arvin become champion? I think the answer is clearly yes. There was not much of a struggle there. As our luck would have it, becoming champion means that Nimona will now stalk us and ask us to battle every five minutes. So here's how one of those matches would go. Like in Rock? Earthquake. Palmot? Big trouble. It has great coverage and can one-shot most of Arvin's team, but Scovillain is once again the MVP. Her Gudra is weak to ice and her Orthworm can't deal enough damage to Cloyster. The Dunsparce is weak to fighting type moves and Skelleridge is too fast for Garganacle. So we get to use Mabostiff a second time. Wow! Nimona was somehow a tougher opponent than Gita. Maybe she should be the new top champion. Now that we're overleveled, we can easily win against Eri and finish up the Star Fall Street storyline. We also got to battle Clavel and Cassiopeia, who's named after a woman in Greek mythology that was sentenced to forever spin around in the night sky because she was arrogant and vain. Makes you wonder what this says about Penny's character. Anywho, both of the battles were clear wins for Arvin, although Clavel was a lot more troublesome, mainly because of the Mascarada. With all three main stories complete, it is time to meet up with real Arvin at the lighthouse and get our final quest from his mom, Professor Sada. After taking a leap into the cloudy area zero, we had to defeat several aggressive Pokemon like Glamora, Screamtail, and Great Tusk, which were all pretty easy especially since we had Penny and Nimona helping us out. I can see why Nimona's here, she's great at fighting things, but why Penny? To turn on the lights? That's kinda all she does. The deeper in we go, the more we learn about Professor Sada, her research to create the Terra Orb, how Arvin and his dad left her, and something about an extra hand to help her continue the work she was doing. After unlocking all four bases, we made our way down to the bottom of Area Zero and opened up the door to Sada's lab. Then a bunch of past Paradox Pokemon rushed out and attacked us, so we did the same thing we did before, teaming up with a friend and taking them down. Penny and Nimona split off from the group to chase down the Pokemon that were trying to run away. Meanwhile, Ryo, Arvin and I finished off the Amonguses, uh, Brute Bonnets, and made our way into the lab. Surprise, surprise, the real Professor Sada is dead. Turns out she was killed by the aggressive Koridon while trying to protect our bike from one of its attacks. First, the Pokemon gets eaten alive, now everybody's wife 
Pikachu get straight up murdered by a Pokemon? They got really dark in this game. Now AI robot Sada lives on, trying to find a way to stop the time machine from bringing in any more past Paradox Pokemon to the present. This part of the game's writing broke my immersion entirely. I can believe the time travel thing, I can believe the creation of a robot that looks like Sada. Heck, I believe in a world where creatures possess elemental abilities and can shrink down to fit inside a tiny little Pokeball and one of them can possess your cell phone. But the explanation for AI Sada is a different story. Maybe it's because I have a master's degree in machine learning, which is the basis for AI, but the explanation for AI Sada's existence made a zero sense. I will probably make a dedicated video on this topic because that writing was just inexcusable. Anyways, in order to stop the time machine, we needed to defeat AI Sada in battle. Not because AI Sada is evil or anything, but we need to beat her in battle because the time machine also has an AI that takes over Sada's body and makes her battle us. Look, if we're gonna complain about the amount of water in Hoenn and how annoying Hop was, are we really gonna ignore the blatantly horrible sci-fi writing in the climax of this game's plot? I can look over the glitches and the slow loading times of basic things like the Pokemon box, but the writing in this game's super villain was somehow even worse than Rose. Sure, it looked super cool, but the lore behind it was just disappointing. The other sad truth is that Arvin's team, if kept true to the in-game design, cannot possibly win against evil AI Sada. That's because Greedon can't do anything against Slitherwing, but is really needed to counter some of the other Pokemon later on in the battle. So I changed things up a bit, and had Garganaco out front to set up some stealth rocks, then followed up with Scovillain to blast this fighting bug back into extinction. Greedon is bulky enough to handle Fluttermane, and also to paralyze Screamtail. I dropped my one-time heal on Greedon, then continued to body slam this tough puff until we knocked it out. One of the hardest parts about this battle is that nearly all of AI Sada's Pokemon have some sort of draining move that keeps restoring their health. And since we couldn't paralyze the ancient Among Us, poor Greedon got knocked out. Toadscrew finished it off, as well as that Sandy Shocks, which absolutely destroyed my team during the first attempt. That left her with just Roaring Moon, which happens to be weak to ice type moves. And there you have it. Could Arvin take on the Titan Pokemon by himself? Yes. Could he become champion? Absolutely. Could he take on Team Star? Uh uh, area's too strong. And could he defeat AI Sada and stop the time machine from bringing in even more dangerous Pokemon from the past? Yes, as long as he doesn't send out Greedon first. Overall, Arvin's team was pretty good. It was well balanced and had plenty of good type coverage, making him a strong enough trainer to catch the eye of someone like Nimona. If it wasn't for all of the emotional damage he took during the game's story, Arvin would have been Paldea's very best. But since this poor boy lost his mother to a berserk Pokemon from the past, and almost lost his best friend trying to look for her in Area Zero, his focus wasn't on Pokemon battles. Instead, Arvin has a heart of gold, and simply wishes to learn how to make food good enough to heal Pokemon who cannot be helped by potions or Burger King employees. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, slide down in the comments below and let me know which character you'd like to see a video on next. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you in the next one. And now it's time to enjoy a nice, warm Jambin Bird.